All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, my name is Leisha Carlson, and I teach philosophy at Providence College. Um, I work in the area of philosophy of disability, and uh, I want to thank Joe and Shelley, Jamie, and all of the, the organizers of this amazing conference. It's a real honor to be back here again this year, and it's especially um, exciting to be chairing this session. So our speaker today is Megan Dean, who is an assistant professor of philosophy at Michigan State University, and her areas of research are feminist bioethics, and in particular with a focus on the ethics of eating. And some of her recent publications include Eating as a Self-Shaping Activity, The Case of Young Women's Vegetarianism and Eating Disorders, which is co-authored. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's not co-authored. And your co-authored piece is Covert Administration of Medication in Food, a Worthwhile Moral Gamble, question mark, which is in the Journal of Medical Ethics. Um, just a couple of things about the session. If you need to use the captioning, which is being done by Zoom, you can click on the live transcript link down at the bottom of the screen. And from there, you can also adjust the font size or see a full transcript. So we will have um, the talk from Megan, and then we'll move into the question and answers. And you can write any questions that you have using the Q&A function. So Megan will be speaking um, about philosophy of food, um, the title of her talk, Putting Dietary Restrictions on the Table on Hospitality and Ableism. Thank you, Megan. I think I cut off the last part of your, of your title. Apologies. I'll turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, let me share my screen and then you can see the rest of the, the title. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. And thank you to Shelly and Jill for inviting me and to all the organizers um, and everybody for sharing your uh, wonderful work with us all. Um, so as Lisa said, my name is Megan. Um, I'm an assistant professor of philosophy at Michigan State. Um, and um, I'm a white woman with short brown hair and glasses. And I'm sitting in my home office with some books behind me and a sign that says, it's good you are here and it is good that you are all here. I'm, I'm really happy to be here too. So my talk today is called Putting Dietary Restrictions on the Table on Hospitality and Ableism at Shared Meals. Um, and unfortunately, there are lots of ways that ableism can show up um, at shared meals, um, you know, from who gets invited in the first place, who can get into the building, who can actually um, ha have a space at the table. Um, but today I'm going to focus on um, epistemic forms of ableism in particular. And so I have a little addition to my title there. Um, so um, some of the, what I'm going to say today was actually recently published in um, Gastronomica, the Food Studies Journal, if you would like to read more um, about that. And, but this work is ongoing, um, and so I really appreciate all of your comments and um, critiques as I move forward uh, with this project. Uh, most of my slides will be of words or phrases that match with what I'll say, um, but a few have images, including this title slide which is a sort of retro photograph of probably from the 60s or 70s of some older white women around a table sharing a meal of what looks like a large pot of chili, some fruit and vegetables and, and bread. Um, and this image is from the free photo sharing website Unsplash, which I highly recommend if you need photos for your, for your work. Okay. Um, so my work on hospitality and dietary restriction was inspired by a blog post. Um, in 2012, an article originally titled The Most Difficult Dinner Guest Ever and Five Delicious Meals to Feed Them, this is, um, yes, um, appeared on the American flu food blog, The Kitchen. And it was accompanied by um, a colorful Venn diagram, which I have on the slide here, and I'll describe in a second. And, and the diagram was done by Amy Sly. And so this diagram has five overlapping circles. Um, and in the middle where they all overlap is uh, what Sly calls the worst dinner guest ever. And so this dinner, worst dinner guest ever is 
um, vegan, gluten intolerant, allergic to nuts, lactose intolerant, and allergic to eggs. Um, so the blog post that this showed up on was actually dedicated to offering some recipes that would accommodate um, these different dietary needs, which I actually think some of the recipes looked really good. Um, but the, the graphic itself especially sparked a lot of controversy in the comment section. Um, there were a few commenters who actually agreed with the diagram suggestion that dietary constraints indicate a failure of appropriate guest behavior. Um, and interestingly, this is a, a view that's apparently shared by Michael Pollan um, and quote unquote, the French, um, who, according to philosophers of food, Raymond Boisvert and Lisa Helke, um, quote, gaze upon any personal dietary prohibition as bad manners. Uh, but the most of the commenters on the post actually disagreed with this. Um, maybe somebody's um, dietary restrictions made selecting a menu challenging in the sense that accommodating them alongside other considerations of budget, cooking skills, knowledge, um, time constraints, and so on, it might take some creativity, but that didn't make them a difficult or bad-mannered guest. Actually, providing a guest with the meal they can safely enjoy is part of being a good host. Um, so, let me see. Um, I've included just a, a little sampling of the, the comments so you can get a taste of um, what folks were saying. So here's commenter Cynthia Bertelson saying, I must say, I long for the days when people came to dinner, they ate what the frazzled cook placed in front of them. Um, and in reply, commenter Westfield said, really, I have celiac disease. Would you serve me bread and say I ought to eat it because you are frazzled? How is that hospitality? If having guests frazzle you, then you should not have them. Um, so, according to Helke and Bobert, who write about hospitality um, extensively in their book, Philosophers at Table, um, this view that it's the host's responsibility to accommodate guest dietary needs is actually representative of um, a re fairly recent societal shift in the United States, and, and that's the context in which they're writing. So as food hypersensitivities like allergies and intolerances have become better understood, um, a greater weight has fallen on hosts to accommodate guests' dietary needs rather than guests being expected to um, eat whatever the frazzled hosts <laughs> place in front of them. Helgi and Bouvier note that there are um, still limits to what a host should be expected to accommodate in terms of, of guests. Um, I, I sort of think about a friend's cousin who came to Christmas dinner while on a juice cleanse uh, there as maybe a limit case. Um, but with the worst dinner guest ever, at least, um, the host's responsibilities to accommodate are very clear. And Helgi and Bovere note that when guests have food allergies in particular, because hosts can make guests seriously ill and even threaten their lives, um, and that harm can, um, quote, readily be avoided by adjusting the menu, then the host has a clear responsibility to do that. Now, ethically speaking, um, this is a sort of uh, ethics 101 point, like we should avoid harming others <laughs> as a general principle, um, but specifically in the realm of hospitality, hosts take on responsibility for the well-being of their guests um, when they are hosting them. Um, so clearly, I, I hope, um, knowingly harming a guest or risking serious harm to them um, is a failure of that responsibility. And we would hope that even Michael Pollan um, and the quote unquote French, um, I, I say quote unquote because anytime Americans talk about the French, I think that they're talking about some mythical group of people and not actually French people. Um, but uh, I would hope that even they would recognize it's poor manners for a host to knowingly serve guests that will make them ill um, and might even kill them. Um, but if we look at the experiences of people with um, food hypersensitivities like allergies and tolerances and, um, and other gut issues, as I'll call them and explain that in a second, um, it appears that some hosts are actually failing um, in this regard. Um, and today I want to offer one possible explanation for this. Um, so I'm going to argue that people with food allergies and relevantly similar gut issues can be subject to forms of testimonial injustice and testimonial smothering about their gut issues. Um, so the testimonial injustice specifically unfairly undermines the credibility of their claim that they have gut issues. And they may also be subject to testimonial smothering, which discourages them from disclosing their food restrictions and precludes hosts from accommodating their needs. 
Um, I am going to argue that these forms of epistemic injustice raise several moral concerns, including the fact that it can prevent hosts from living up to their obligations of hospitality. Um, but in short, even if hosts agree that in principle they should accommodate guest dietary restrictions due to gut issues, these forms of epistemic injustice may prevent hosts from recognizing when they should do so. So today I'm going to make a case for these claims and then conclude by detailing the ethical implications of this analysis for hosts and for guests. Um, and I'm going to emphasize that being a good host requires epistemic humility um, and work to undercut testimonial smothering around gut issues. And overall, my aim is um, to offer an analysis that both pushes back against this epistemic um, forms of ableism toward people with gut issues um, and to enable better hospitality, because I do think that hospitality is a morally valuable practice um, that can contribute to human flourishing. So I, mean, I can say more about that later on. Um, first, I want to explain what gut issues are. So, well, in, in Halki and Bovere's work, they really single out food allergies. Um, I take my argument to apply to a broader range of gut issues, which is a concept I take from Jane Dryden's work. Um, Helke and Bovere's rationale for singling out allergy is the possibility of serious illness, major harm, and a potentially lethal anaphylactic reaction. That's the kind of allergy they have in mind. Um, but the possibility of imminent death aside, however, there are many other food hypersensitivities and health conditions that result in similar sorts of predictable suffering and harm caused by food. So I'm going to suggest that what's important for hospitality is not um, the specific mechanism by which one is harmed um, by food, whether it be an immune reaction or something else, um, but rather the fact that an eater may be harmed in a relatively quick, direct, and predictable way by ingesting or being exposed to a food or ingredient. And I'm borrowing um, Dryden's term gut issues to capture this broader group of conditions, um, which can include things like food allergies, intolerances, celiac disease, um, and IBS. Um, but it doesn't need to be a diagnosed condition or food hypersensitivity um, to count as a gut issue. And I can say more about that later. Um, I do want to be clear, I'm not suggesting that the same methods of accommodation or practices are required um, for food allergies or IBS. Um, clearly, different levels of vigilance and food preparation practices are appropriate. Um, but I'm arguing that at base, hosts have the responsibility to take steps to accommodate guests with any sort of gut issue. Okay. So um, as I said, I do take it that hosts have a responsibility to avoid serving guests with gut issues, foods that will predictably, directly, and relatively quickly harm them. And I, I think, I hope that that's a relatively uncontroversial statement. Um, however, thanks to widespread doubts that many people who claim to have gut issues are telling the truth, hosts may have trouble discerning to whom they owe these accommodations. So the, the idea that many people who report food allergies, intolerances, or other gut issues are faking, exaggerating, or mistaken is quite common. Um, sociologist Tobias Hauserman, who I've quoted on the slide here, says, um, most cases of self-reported food allergies lack scientific rationale. Um, these claims, like Hauserman's, are apparently motivated by discrepancies between self-reported food allergies and what are deemed to be, quote-unquote, true food allergies. Um, so a paper from 2019, uh, for example, states that 19% of um, U.S. adults report at least one food allergy, but only 10.8% are estimated to, quote-unquote, actually have one. Um, and there's a similar inflationary trend noted with food intolerances in the literature as well. Um, so Turnbull, Adams, and Gerard, who I've quoted on the slide here, uh, note that perceptions of adverse reactions to food, whether allergy or intolerance, are common. Um, but as with allergies, the prevalence of food intolerance may be inflated due to issues with self-reporting. Uh, and these authors note one study in which 20% of the population in a UK survey reported having food intolerances, but double anonymized placebo-controlled food challenges, which are um, the gold standard method of diagnosis for food hypersensitivities, um, show that less than 2% actually had what they call true reactions to food. Um, so one of the possible explanations for these discrepancies sort of floating around the literature um, is that some people with gut issues mistakenly believe they have food allergies. So they have some sort of gut issue, but they 
mistakenly think it is a food allergy. Um, people might confuse, the suggestion is that people might be confusing intolerances or other gastrointestinal issues for allergies because of similar symptoms or because they have a positive response to avoiding the food that they, they think is causing the problems. Um, or some people may be conflating food intolerances with allergies due to widespread misunderstandings about what those conditions are. Um, when it comes to intolerances specifically, uh, uh, like the, yeah, the Turnbull Adams and Garrard study, um, there's a suggestion that some of the people that are reporting food intolerances, they're not confused or just misdiagnosing themselves. They actually are, are don't have any gut issue at all. Um, and well, Turnbull is, and colleagues are careful to frame that in a you know particular way uh, to avoid saying that, oh, people are just lying. Um, or I, I found another paper, Ortolani and Postrello, who, who asserts that many patients believe that they are allergic or intolerant to certain foods solely on the basis of self-persuasion. All right, so the suggestion that people may be self-deluded or less than honest about gut issues um, is there. And it's also found in some qualitative research that interviews people who have gut issues. Um, so Olson and colleagues interviewed uh, young people with celiac disease, and many of them reported that when they would tell others about their celiac, some people would accuse them of making it up. Um, Nettleton and colleagues did a study of UK adults, some of whom had food intolerances, and one of their participants suggested um, that people who claim to have food intolerances just want attention. And I'll come back to this participant in a minute, but uh, notably, um, he himself has food intolerances. He just thinks other people are making them up. Um, okay, so the suggestion that most or even many people who claim to have a food allergy intolerance or other gut issue are faking, exaggerating, or mistaken means that simply reporting a gut issue can subject a given reporter to doubt. And when someone's gut issue is taken to be suspect simply in virtue of reporting it, um, this unjustifiably lowers the reporter's credibility. And I suggest this can be understood as an instance of testimonial injustice. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this concept, um, but uh, testimonial injustice refers to when an audience fails to give a person's testimony or reports an appropriate uh, level of credibility on the basis of an identity prejudice. Uh, and an identity prejudice can be understood as some bias about a social group to whom the speaker belongs. So it's a prejudice about um, who the speaker is taken to be. And when this sort of bias is used to calibrate someone's credibility rather than um, evaluating their credibility on their own merits, um, their testimony may be unjustly disbelieved or taken less seriously than it would be otherwise. Um, and that's a phrasing from Buchmann Ho and, and Goldberg. So just as an illustration, um, I have here um, a quote from the participant I mentioned earlier in Nettleton's study, um, who himself has food intolerances, but he doubts that other people have them. He says, you're never sure if it's just because they don't like it or whether they actually can't eat the food. Um, so I'm suggesting that the assumption that most people or many people who claim to have gut issues are faking, exaggerating, and mistaken, functions as a negative identity prejudice, targeting members of people, uh, members of the group, people with gut issues. And this prejudice unjustly diminishes the credibility of those who belong to this group, specifically the credibility of reports about which gut issue somebody has or whether they have them at all. Um, importantly, this testimonial injustice um, directed at people with gut issues occurs in a very specific context um, where that person's testimony carries a lot of weight. Um, evidence that might counter a credibility deficit and lend support to someone's claims is unlikely to be available due to the nature of many gut issues. And um, for one, many symptoms of gut issues are private, um, either in the sense that they occur internally and might not be perceptible to um, anybody else, things like digestive upset and, or headaches, um, or because they occur in private locations like bathrooms, and they're often taboo to discuss in public. Um, the delayed onset of some gut issue reactions is also relevant here. Um, I had an acquaintance once tell me that they had accidentally served gluten to someone with celiac disease, but they, which they were a little concerned about, but they said, oh no, but they seemed fine. Um, well, my acquaintance would likely not be 
privy to um, what this unfortunate guest experienced, um, both because she wouldn't have been there to see or hear it, and because of taboos around discussing digestive symptoms, um, and specifically taboos around um, telling your host that their food made you sick, um, probably she wouldn't have heard um, if the food did make her sick in the in the days after that unfortunate meal. Um, in addition, there are, uh, I mentioned this earlier, but there are widespread misunderstandings of gut issues, what they are, how they work, um, which can exacerbate doubts about um, reported gut issues. So just for example, um, food allergies, especially the IgE mediated ones, um, which are the ones that can cause anaphylaxis, um, they're most often present in kids, but one in four adults that have food allergies develop them as adults. But a lot of people don't know that. And so that can lead um, people to doubt somebody's new or sudden claims of food allergies. And um, but what might appear like of somebody just jumping on the bandwagon of like a trendy food hypersensitivity is somebody actually recognizing the source of their longstanding issues thanks to increased social awareness. Um, and these factors mean that people with gut issues may be subject to testimonial injustice in contexts where it is unlikely that this doubt will be outweighed or mitigated by other evidence. Um, it's also really important to note that groups whose credibility is in doubt for other prejudicial reasons may be subject to compounded testimonial injustice regarding their gut issues. So for people who have um, other disabilities or chronic illnesses, gut issues may be viewed as like just another thing that the person is malingering um, about or have brought upon themselves through mismanagement. Um, stereotypes or presumptions about women as prone to psychosomatic illness, eating disorders or fad dieting can contribute to the perception that women are self-deluded or trying to conceal their disordered eating with claims about gut issues. And prejudices about Black people as untrustworthy reporters of their own pain or as invincible or immune to bodily harm, um, and including uh, the belief that Black people simply don't get food allergies, may significantly exacerbate prejudicial doubt when it comes to, to their reports. Um, so this raises a variety of moral concerns. Um, first, feminist epistemologists have argued that to be test subject to testimonial injustice is to be disrespected as an hour. And um, as Jacqueline Scully notes in her discussion of epistemic injustice and disability, the capacity to know and to contribute to the production of knowledge are closely linked to rationality, which many people take to be central to what makes humans persons in the moral sense. And obviously we can trouble that, but um, there it is. So to be respected as a knower can undermine someone's moral standing. Um, another moral concern is that testimonial injustice um, in this sort of context can place eaters at risk of harm. Um, if someone's reports of gut issues aren't given appropriate uptake, then people preparing or selecting foods might be inattentive to food safety in the belief that, well, it's not going to harm them, right? And um, harming others, whether directly, intentionally, or through negligence is, um, you know, to put it one way, a violation of the basic pr moral principle of non-maleficence, right? Um, it's, it's not good. So this is, you know, always a problem, but particularly, like I said before, in the context of hospitality, when hosts take on explicit responsibility for the well-being of their guests. Um, this is a clear violation of that. Uh, testimonial injustice toward people with gut issues in these hospitality contexts is also troubling because of its impacts on hospitality. So rather than perceiving their responsibility to accommodate um, guests as clear and straightforward, hosts may perceive the situation as like up for debate or as, as not requiring accommodation. Um, and then the host would not only disrespect the guests as a knower, risk harming their guests, uh, but also just fails to fulfill their responsibility as, as a good host. And ironically, when hosts doubt guests' gut issues, it, it can make the guests seem difficult and bad-mannered for making special food requests or for refusing to partake in certain dishes. And I think that's partly what is sort of behind um, that graphic that I showed at the beginning, even though I think that's meant to be tongue in cheek, the graphic, but I do think that this sort of impulse is behind that. Um, so testimonial injustice in this context, I think can make guests with gut issues seem like they're the ones feeling to live up to their hospitality obligations. They're the ones being the worst guests ever when it's actually the hosts who are feeling. Um, and I do want to be clear, it's totally possible that there are some people who claim um, to have food allergies or intolerances who might be mistaken about that. 
Um, some people might even be lying. You know, I can say more in the Q and A about why we shouldn't be surprised if some people are mistaken about their diagnosis of, of gut issues. There's a lot of epistemic issues there in terms of um, medical diagnosis. But making the claim that you have a gut issue shouldn't be a reason to doubt the claimant in itself, right? It's not the same as saying that you've seen a miracle or a unicorn, right? Even if we take the low end of estimated prevalence of food allergies and intolerance alone, like not even counting IBS, which is very prevalent, these are really common conditions. But more importantly, um, this goes back to something that Cato said earlier too, um, and Christine Weisler's work on epistemic injustice and ableism, the question is like, who has epistemic authority here? So in, in hospitality context, especially the people who are doing the doubting, right? The hosts, they're not gut issue experts. Um, and um, again, I can say more in the Q&A about why medical expertise on these issues is not super reliable. Um, but more to the point, the question, the question is really about um, a claim about bodily experience. So even if someone is mistaken about what kind of gut issue they have, What's relevant to hospitality is the claim that a food or ingredient predictably causes them harm. So those claiming a gut issue are, to use Weisler's words, I'm actually in a better position to know about that than hosts, right? So we should direct our skepticism toward um, doubting hosts' doubts <laughs> and not, I guess, making claims about their own bodily experience. Okay, so, um, one way that knowers negotiate testimonial injustice is by keeping things to themselves. So when making claims um, can mean being doubted, disbelieved, or disrespected, um, people may decide to simply say nothing at all. Um, Veronica Ivey puts it this way. So if a speaker recognizes that an audience is unlikely to give her adequate uptake, she'll choose not to speak. Um, and this is what Christy Dodson has identified as testimonial smothering. Um, importantly, the silence is not a free choice, but it's made in a coercive context where the risks of sharing are deemed too high. Um, and there's a variety of evidence suggesting that people with gut issues experience testimonial smothering around their gut issues. So in her interviews with people with gut issues, Jane Dryden notes a general reluctance to speak up about gut issues. Um, and Olson and colleagues in the study I mentioned earlier of young people with celiac found that some teens concealed their celiac disease from others to avoid disbelief and accusations that they were making it up or being self-important. Um, Nettleton and colleagues, I mentioned one of their participants earlier, um, but they talked to quite a few people um, and found that some participants with food intolerances preferred to eat the foods that made them sick or the culprit food um, and literally suffer the consequences rather than ask for accommodations or refuse food at shared meals and have to explain why. Um, so I have a quote on the slide from one of their participants who says, I'm afraid I'll just eat it, the culprit food, the food that makes them sick. And then I think to myself, okay, for the next few days, I'm just going to have to hide away quietly. And I do want to note here as well that with testimonial smothering, we can have compounding forms of prejudice. So Daniel Glabo has some really interesting research on um, food allergies, and she draws attention to specific barriers for Black people reporting their own or their loved ones food allergies that might intensify their experience of testimonial smothering. Um, Glabo suggests that Black people, and um, this is in the context of the United States, may be more likely than white people and others to be judged as disruptive, demanding, aggressive, rude, or bad-mannered for making what appear as unreasonable or exaggerated requests for food accommodations. So the cost of being disbelieved or taken less seriously might be very, a lot higher for Black people compared to white people, and that can exacerbate this testimonial smothering. So this obviously raises um, its own set of moral concerns, right? If guests decide um, not to share, because of testimonial smothering, then they risk ingesting harmful foods. Um, hosts can't accommodate somebody if they don't know that, that there is a need for accommodation and eaters can find it um, difficult to gather knowledge about which dishes they should avoid without outing themselves. Um, and as in reflected in the quotation I read earlier, some people may even knowingly eat culprit foods um, to avoid having to explain themselves. So in these ways, testimonial smothering can, can really contribute to physical harm. Um, in addition, um, testimonial smothering produces a situation where neither the guest or the host can live up to their responsibilities of hospitality. So to go back to Boisvert and Helke for a minute, 
They note that in the case of food allergies, um, the clear responsibility to accommodate is on the host, but they also note that guests have a responsibility to inform hosts of their needs. And testimonial and smothering clearly um, undermines guest ability to do that. And I do want to be very clear that remaining silent in this context is not a culpable moral feeling. It's a coerced situation. Um, but when a guest doesn't inform the host of their food needs, um, then the host can't live up to their obligations to accommodate those needs and may end up inadvertently harming their guests. Okay. So what does all of this mean for dinner or supper? <laughs> Um, as Canadians say, I don't know if, if, what people in the UK say, I suspect maybe it's over. Um, one of the key takeaways from my analysis is that hosts really need to be aware of the epistemic context surrounding people with gut issues and conscious of their own credibility assessments uh, of people with gut issues. So as other scholars have argued in the context of epistemic injustice toward people with disabilities and chronic illness more generally, epistemic humility is really key. And this involves, as Anita Ho writes, a commitment to make a realistic assessment of what one knows and does not know, and to restrict one's confidence and claims to knowledge only to what one actually knows about his or her um, specialized domain. And to reiterate, when people are making claims about their own gut issues in hospitality context, they are the ones who have epistemic authority, especially given the epistemic context surrounding gut issues that I've outlined, like many symptoms are private, they're taboo to discuss in public, there are significant misunderstandings about how gut issues work, when they develop, and so on. Um, hosts really need to practice significant humility about their credibility assessments of their guest claims. Um, and furthermore, my analysis suggests that even if a host does practice epistemic humility and would give appropriate credibility to their guest claims, guests may be reluctant to share due to past experiences with testimonial injustice. So, Hosts need to acknowledge the context of testimonial smothering and do what they can to assure guests that their reports will be taken seriously. Um, and while the bulk of epistemic responsibility in these cases really lies on hosts, guests with gut issues can also contribute to the overall epistemic context that produces these forms of epistemic injustice. So I think that singling out food allergies as the only gut issue that warrants accommodation contributes to this context. And that's something that a lot of people do. Um, also pointing the finger at people who report gut issues that aren't food allergies as crying wolf and blaming them for contributing to an atmosphere of doubt. Um, that's quite common as well. And when instead we should be critiquing the people doing the doubting, right? Um, so these are ways that, that even people who have gut issues can contribute to this um, sort of epistemic atmosphere. And it's important to remember that, you know, the categories of guests and hosts are not mutually exclusive. Sometimes we're guests, sometimes we're hosts. And as hosts, people with gut issues are certainly not immune to prejudicial doubt, um, as the example that I mentioned earlier, the man who has food intolerances but thinks everyone else is making them up. Um, so we'll lots more um, to dig into there regarding the ethics of hospitality and dietary restriction, but I'm gonna leave it there for now. Um, this is a bibliography slide with some selected sources. I'm happy to share this with anyone who wants a copy. Um, the slides are also, I should have mentioned this earlier, but they are available on my website, um, um, meganadine.com. And um, so, yes, that's it. Thank you. And I look forward to chatting with you all. All right. Thank you so much, Megan. There are lots of little clapping hands and hearts rising up from the bottom of my screen. Um, and I just realized that I forgot to uh, give a quick description of myself. So I'm a white woman sitting in front of a bookshelf with short gray hair. And um, again, my name is Leisha. I'm happy to be chairing this session. Um, so I will be reading questions from the audience. And it looks like there's already one from R.A. Briggs. Um, I want to ask about a strategy for responding to the epistemic issues you raised. I guess I think that people's self-diagnoses of gut issues are often mistaken because the causal factors involved are complicated. You suggested that hosts are in a worse epistemic position than their guests with respect to the subject matter, and I agree. Another possible response is to shift the subject matter about which hosts should defer to guests. 
The guest is an authority about what menu will help them feel safe and cared for, and hosts ought to help their guests feel safe and cared for. And parenthetically, I think people with vegan or kosher restrictions should be accommodated in the same way. How much we really need to unravel complicated medical epistemology to do the interpersonal ethics. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I think I think that's exactly right. And I think I think what's like um, part of what's troubling to me about some of the questions that come up when people are noting, like, oh, pe- you know, there's there are people who who self-report and it's not true. Um, is is yeah that people are kind of trying to do this weird medical epistemology <laughs> epistemology thing when I think especially in these interpersonal contexts like hospitality but other ones as well it doesn't matter <laughs> it really does what matters is um somebody is telling you that this is what I need in order to be safe and um great you know like <laughs> I just, I, I, um, I totally agree with you. And and I like the way you put that about shifting the subject matter about which host should defer to guests, like somebody's medical diagnosis or lack of medical diagnosis. Cause like I, I kind of mentioned a couple of times, um, it's actually really hard to get medical diagnosis for a lot, of, a lot of gut issues. They don't have good methods for doing that. Um, and a lot of them are unreliable. So, you know, that's, that is not relevant. You know, that that is really not relevant for for these sort of contexts at all. Um, and so um, when we think about hospitality, especially and the issue is, um, you know, I think I hope that when we're entering into hospitality sort of relationships, we have this. Care, <laughs> you know, we have this attitude of care that that if we're hosting somebody, it's because we want to show them that we care about them in some way, whether it's a colleague or a friend or a neighbor or whatever, right? And if with that sort of in the background, um, it really, somebody's specific diagnosis really doesn't matter. What what really matters is exactly as you said, like what will make this host feel, this guest feel safe and cared for. Yeah, thanks. So thank you so much for that. Okay. Did you want to step in, Joe? Uh, go to the Q and A okay. first because I've spoken a lot, so I'm I'm here in a reserve. Okay. Sure. All right. Um, so we have a question from Lynn. Thank you so much for your talk. I appreciated your application of epistemic injustice to this topic. I wonder along the lines of your final thought about expanding gut issues beyond allergies whether or not, and I think we should, expand hospitality beyond mere gut issues to also include a wide range of dietary preferences and needs. My motivation for this is that people might experience harm from food in other ways that merely their gut, such as through sensory or texture needs common in autism or other trauma around food such as might be experienced by people who have suffered from eating disorders, but also mere preferences where eating something may be experienced as distasteful to a guest. Yes, thank you, Lynn. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I, I, I chose to focus on gut issues in this paper because I had this impression that Oh, most people would agree that, of course, if somebody has something like a food allergy or intolerance, you shouldn't serve them food that's going to hurt them. <laughs> and then it was like, well, okay, but people are failing to do that. So why? Why is that? You know, if a lot of people who who have these things that should be that we would think are obvious, um, obvious cases of accommodation are not being accommodated. What's going on there? Um, but I I agree with you that I that hospitality I think um, needs to extend beyond those issues and you know I think that uh, um, even things like preferences I think I, I want to do some more thinking about preferences I'm interested if other people have thoughts about that um, because you know there is a wide 
array of reasons why people don't want to eat certain foods or why certain foods um, are troubling to them or um, and so on. And I, I, I think in the case of hospitality, it is interesting to think about, um, you know, when Because I so let, let me backtrack again. I I think hospitality is interesting for what one of the reasons I think it's interesting is because I do think there's something to this suggestion that if you go to someone's house and they make food for you and it's burnt and it doesn't taste good, <laughs> that you should still probably there's something to like eating it and saying you liked it, you know, <laughs> um, trying it and saying you liked it, um, thanking them for it, and there's there is something I think valuable in that sort of impulse, and I'm I'm really interested in thinking about how do we like hold that part of being a good guest alongside acknowledging that we need to support people in in the foods and ways of eating that that are safe for them and that they are that will make them feel. I'm going back to the um, comment from our, from R.A. Briggs before, make them feel safe and cared for, <laughs> right? Um, but, you know, some people just are bad cooks, and I think that they should still be able to host and we should be able to, to um, show appreciation for their food. Uh, and so I think, I think that there's some complex, you know, um, issues going on there in hospitality, which don't apply to other situations like ordering food at a restaurant or something like that. You don't have to order food you don't like at a restaurant or eat it or anything like that. Um, so yes, thank you. I, I agree with you that um, there's a wide range of issues that can think about the ethics of in relation to hospitality, not just, not just gut issues. And that's kind of where I'd like to go next with, with this. Great. We have many questions now in the uh, Q&A. So Kristen writes, love centering hospitality in this work. I have a weird inverse example. I worked in restaurants for decades. Chefs were militant about contamination around allergies. Now, when people with anaphylactic allergies come to my house, I do cleaning and decontamination protocols. I have had guests who are more cavalier than me. I get moral distress about someone having a reaction at my home. Is this on topic or a deep derailing or outlier example. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah. So I think that the restaurant um, example is interesting and it is different in enough ways that I was trying to focus on more um, sort of interpersonal examples. But I do think that there are some parallels. Well, one of the issues with restaurants is that there are a lot of laws um, and regulations that come into play that are different from what would happen in a a household um, context that sort of change the obligations that people have um, when it comes to to dealing with, uh, especially IgE mediated allergies like the ones that cause anaphylaxis. Um, but I will say that I have found like some sources that show people who work at restaurants also have this sort of epistemic. They have also they are directing testimonial injustice toward the patrons who come in and claim to have allergies or intolerances. You know, I think that that is just as common um, for people who work in, in those contexts than not. And, you know, you I sometimes see these examples floating around memes and things like that of like, look at this receipt, like from this restaurant, this order someone put in and it has all of these, you know, requests due to allergies, but like, that's so stupid. These allergies don't even exist or whatever, you know? Um, so I think that that is really, um, it, what the things that I have identified also apply to those contexts, but they are also relevantly different because there are like in the United States, you know, there are certain ADA regulations and things like that, that are also applying. Um, so yes, thank you. Um, thank you for that example. And I, I mean, I do think also just, I think that some people who have, especially food allergies and gut issues, um, I, you know, everyone gets to choose their own level of comfort with what, what they, what they feel safe with and so on. Um, but I, I think there's something to this like testimonial smothering thing where people have had like, um, experiences where they either weren't taken seriously 
or they were accused of like being self-important. I think that that's like a really interesting phrase that came up in the research that I read, um, that there can be like a reaction of like, oh no, I, I, I don't make a big deal about it. Like it's okay. <laughs> um, that kind of um, is produced by this, this really messed up context that people are negotiating these complex interpersonal relationships with these gut issues. Um, and um, yeah, so I think, uh, thank you for your example. I'll think some more about that. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Corinne. Thank you for this talk, Megan. I have a question about the language of accommodation. Mm -hmm. Your talk frames dietary needs as accommodations that are needed by persons with gut issues. My worry is that this individualizes the issue, i.e. some people need special treatment, some people are unreasonable guests. I'm wondering if you have thought about the language of accommodations in this literature in relation to the language of access and how these might be different. I'm not sure what this would do, but something to think about. Thank you so much. Corinne. Um, yes, I haven't thought too much about this in relation to that literature specifically, but this is a great suggestion. I'm going to do that. And I think, I think you're right that um, the way that I framed this is, is very individualistic. And part of that, I guess, is um, because I, I think that's how the issue is, <laughs> you know, I think that's how the issue was framed. And so I was trying to think about in terms of, oh, well, this, this person so if, if you think the default is you go, you eat whatever the frazzled chef puts in front of you, <laughs> right? And then if you don't, well, you need to have a reason. So it becomes individualized. Well, why do you need the exception? Like, why are, why do you need an exception? And um, yeah, I, I, um, I think that I need to think more about how to push back on that. I mean, I think some of the... Um, for this project, I have shied away from like giving advice because I felt like it was getting a little bit too much. Um, now I'm giving like mismanners advice about hospitality, which I actually think is super valuable, but I'm not super qualified. Um, to, I don't have expertise in that area, but I think that um, in terms of hosting, like like adopting some of the principles of universal design, or you know, I've seen some conferences a lot of folks here have been at where where the food is um, in just pre-planned to be accessible to people who have many different sorts of food needs. And then on top of that, people can ask for special, special different um, um, foods. Um, and I think that that's an excellent, you know, I think that's an excellent practice um, that might go some way to, to shifting to this more, the, the language of access um, rather than accommodation. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to give that some more thought. I really appreciate that suggestion. Thank you so much. All right. looks like we have a few more minutes. So we have a question from Amandine. Thanks for a great talk. I wonder if you have any thoughts about food restrictions connected to religion, which can also be, which can, can also often be racialized. Perhaps this point touches on part of the question Ray just asked, basically just thinking about these food issues from a variety of axes of positionality and intersectionality. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I was thinking because, um, you know, I thought it was really interesting that that uh, the the blog post that kind of started all my thinking about this, neither the blog post nor that um, diagram mentioned like kosher, for example, or halal, right? Um, which I think are some of the you know, more common food restrictions that, that people would know about if you asked around, you know. Um, and I, I think that was, I suspect that that was very much on purpose because they didn't want, because there was this tongue in cheek sort of attitude, you know, especially in the diagram of like, this is the worst dinner guest ever. And um, because the author of that piece, um, as far as I can tell is, you know, a white person. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that they likely would not have wanted to have that cheeky sort of implication if they were talking about people, um, who are racialized or, um, yeah. So I, I think, I think that that's a really great point. Um, and I'm so far, I haven't done a lot of reading on, on, um, especially religious 
food restriction and sort of the ethics around that. But I suspect that would be another case where people would automatically say, you know, of course, we, if somebody has a religious restriction against eating something, I'm not going to serve it to them. That would be wrong of me. That would be bad host behavior. Um, but I do wonder if if part of that sort of pushes into this um, other way that people can be excluded from hospitality situations where you, then you just don't get the invite to, to start with, right? Because, well, I don't know how to make that sort of food. And so, you know, then there's... Um, uh, that sort of pushback um, there. And so, yeah, I think um, I appreciate, I appreciate those suggestions. And that's, I definitely want to think some more about um, how these, how these different types of food restrictions for different types of reasons are sort of framed within the ethics of hospitality, um, the religion piece preferences, other sort of disabilities um, or chronic illnesses or, um, other reasons why people might avoid food. Um, so thank, thank you everybody for, for raising all of those um, examples. All right. Thank you, everyone. It looks like we're at time, 1220. So thank you so much again, Megan, for an amazingly provocative, really interesting um, paper and everyone for your contributions. And uh, we will see you back in 10 minutes. Is that right? Thank you all. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll be back in 10 minutes. And so the uh, panelists um, should go backstage. But before you do that, I do just want to uh, thank Megan for really a wonderful talk. And uh, I wasn't expecting to be hearing about the rules of hospitality at this conference. So it, it always surprises me what uh, we are discussing. Fantastic. And uh, thanks so much, Lysia, as well, for hosting and the discussion was fabulous. So back in 10 minutes and I'll see panelists uh, through the backstage door. <laughs>